Amen. We owed a debt we couldn't pay. Right. And uh, Sister Norton and I sang the song, and it was growing every day. But Jesus, he paid it all. And so we're going to be studying about uh, the necessity of repentance, water baptism, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost, the gift of the Holy Ghost. And so uh, today we're looking at the title of our lesson, which I calculate as Lesson 11. And by the way, I have good news for some of you. When we get our new books, they're already here, and they have the big print. I'm excited about that. The last time that we used the literature, it was that's all they had was the small print. But they said, yes, you can order large. I said, you mean we can get large print this time? Oh, yeah. I said, well, give me all of them in large print. <laughs> so if you wanted the little print, I'm sorry. But uh, I, think, I think the large print outweighs the smaller print. Hey, the more I increase in stature and wisdom, the more increasing I need those letters to be. <laughs> so if you all understand what I'm saying. But, but anyway, today we're looking at Lesson 11, which is the call to repentance. And our focus verse is found in Mark uh, 2, 17. And it says, when Jesus heard it, he said unto them, they that are whole need not excuse me, they that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. And so that's our lesson focus today, the call to repentance. And, and uh, that, that word, and I was going to ask somebody that probably knew, knew how to pronounce a Greek word, but since I didn't ask anybody, I'll just do the best I can with this word. But the Greek word for repentance is metanoia. And it simply just means a change of mind. That's what repentance is. You know, in other words, we truly repent uh, with a thorough change of our heart. You know, everything's different. You know, the, the things you used to love, you, you, don't, you don't want to do those things anymore. And the things you used to not love... You know, you, you, you're, you're, you're excited about getting to, to do the things of God. And, and so um, when we truly repent, when we truly repent of our sins, uh, there's going to be a thorough, a thorough changing from sin, and then we're going to be turned toward, toward God. And, and, but this takes place uh, when faith comes alive in our hearts and we feel that sorrow for our sins. You see, faith and repentance, they go hand in hand. Uh, as a matter of fact, they're, they, you can't separate them. In other words, before you can repent, you've got to have faith and believe in the Lord that, that he will forgive you when you do repent. You know? right. if, if you don't have faith, uh, what, what good is you to say, well, I, I'm sorry, you know, it's kind of like the little kid that got caught stealing, you know, candy from the candy store. And he didn't get sorry till he got caught. When he got caught, he was really sorry, you know. But, but that didn't change it from wanting to do it again. But, but with true repentance, we don't want to do it again. We're thankful for what God has done for us. And so, so we change our, our whole outlook on life is, is changed. And, uh, and so true repentance, there's three elements that, that I'd like to look at this morning just for like a foundation. Lots of times, Pastor, he preaches a long time, then he said, that was just my foundation. I hope I don't do that to y'all today. But, but, but here's the thing. There, there's three elements that, that, that let you know that, that true repentance has come into your heart and life. First of all, there's going to be that genuine sorrow uh, toward the Lord because of your sin. Uh, 2 Corinthians 7 and 10 tells us these words. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of. So it takes that godly sorrow in your heart to, to, in other words, you really, really feel like I'm, I'm, I'm wrong. You know, I've done this and I'm wrong, and you feel bad about it. Then, then the next element is that, that strong dislike for sin, and then the fact that you, you turn, turn your life around and you begin to go a different direction, and you forsake your life of sin. And, and, and I couldn't help but just think of Acts 2, 36 and 37. Remember when Peter was preaching on the day of Pentecost, and he began to tell them what they had done, how that they had crucified the Lord of glory, and, and they had taken him by wicked hands, and, and they were the ones that had caused him to be nailed to that cross, and all he did was love them, you know. And so the Bible said in, in Acts 2.36, he said, let, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus 
whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts. In other words, they were convicted in their hearts uh, because they realized they were the ones, they were responsible for this. And here's what they said to Peter, to the rest of the apostles. Men and brethren, what shall we do? In other words, we want to do something. We've done wrong, now help us to know what to do right. And that's what true repentance does. When, when you know that you've been wrong, then you want to change that. You want to do what's right Amen. in God's sight. And then the third element that, that true repentance, uh, of, of true repentance is that the fact that, uh, uh, that there's going to be that humble self-surrender to the will and service of God. And, and, and so here, here we, we're looking at how that uh, scripture, to back this up, we, we find it in Acts 9 and 5 and 6. It says, uh, Paul, he was Paul, but he later became known as Paul. But he, at this time, he was Saul of Tarsus, and he had persecuted the church. He even uh, stood by and held the coats of the men that stoned Stephen to death. And, and he thought he was doing what was right. He thought he was being a true Pharisee of Pharisees, but he didn't realize that he was he was uh, he was bringing uh, uh, harm to God's people because he had not believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. But then we see in Acts nine and five, the Bible said, and he said, "Who art thou, Lord?" And those of you that understand what's happening here, remember he's on his way to uh, Saul is on his way to Damascus, and he's going to have people put in prison. He's got letters in his hand that who is ever whoever is believing on Jesus. Um, following Jesus as th his disciples, they're going to be put in prison. And, and so he, he's going with that intention in his mind. And all of a sudden, around the noonday hour, uh, around uh, the noonday, there was a light that shined down upon him. And, and it, 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 it caused him to fall off of his beast, and he fell to the ground. And the first thing he said unto him, unto what was happening, he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he trembling, this is Saul, he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? He's had an entire change of, of his purpose. All of a sudden, he realizes that he's, he's persecuting uh, the one that he, he should not have been persecuting. That was the Lord Jesus Christ. He recognized him as God Almighty. And he said, Lord, the first thing he wanted to know was, what do you want me to do? And so that's that humble self-surrender to the will and service of God. Folks, that's true repentance. When you've got a mindset, Lord, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'd be willing to do. To do. That is true repentance. And it happened to Saul on his way to Damascus. And the first thing he said was, Lord, what do you want me to do? And, of course, the Lord told him, rise, go to, uh, to the city, and it's going to be told thee what to do. And we know the rest of that story. Uh, I believe at that moment, true repentance took place in Saul of Tarsus' heart. And so we're talking today about a man by the name of John the Baptist and how he came preparing the way of the Lord. And you'll notice uh, when he begins to describe himself, he uses, he uses the word the voice, the voice. Uh, Matthew 3 and 1 is where our lesson begins. It says, in those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, what, were, what was he preaching? Repent, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. Now that means Isaiah, it's spelled with an E there. Saying, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. So we see here, uh, John is preaching repentance and he is telling them that the prophet Isaiah had prophesied about his coming in Isaiah 40 and 3. And here's what Isaiah said about John the Baptist. He said, the voice, there it is again, the voice of him that cried in the wilderness, prepare you the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. And I just want to insert this right here. Before we can go anywhere with God in our walk with God, there's got to be, first of all, true repentance. And the first thing that, that, that John began to say to those people that were there that day to hear him was, repent. And so uh, John the Baptist came preaching this message to the people that they were to repent. Luke 3 and 3, it tells us the same message. And he came into all the country about Jordan preaching the baptiz baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And, and I just want to insert this today. I, I've never really gave him, gave him, 
I'm glad none of our English teachers are in here today. I've never given this a whole lot of thought when we're talking about John the Baptist baptizing in Jordan. But think about the significance of Jordan. Now, this is where John's baptizing his converts. But think about what happened at Jordan many, many years back when the forefathers came over into the promised land. They had to cross over Jordan. And, of course, you know, those of you that have studied your Bible know that when the, the, the Ark of the Covenant that was carried by the, by the priest, when they, their feet touched the river of Jordan, it, it opened up for them to go over that, that river. And so what I'm trying to say is this, this river of Jordan had some significance. If you'll remember when they got over, the children of Israel got over as they're going into the promised land, when they got through passing through Jordan, there were 12 stones that they took and they set up as a memorial there uh, because it was remembering what God had brought them through and to this point. And so uh, this river of Jordan had some significance in, in, the, in the lives of the children of Israel. And now here we see John the Baptist preaching, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And he's baptizing his converts here at this river of Jordan. And, and so what, what this is saying to me is when we repent of our sins and, and we confess them before God and forsake them and we are baptized, and I know we're not talking about baptism today, but, but there's a transition. There is uh, th that those, those old sins are gone. They're buried in that water, that baptismal water. Uh, not that, you know, that, that is a type of, of the grave. And so here John is baptizing these people, washing away their sins in the river of Jordan. And it, it, to me, it just had such a significance there that, that God chose this very place where his people were crossing over to go into the promised land. In other words, if we're going to go anywhere with God, into God's blessings, we've got to be obedient to God, amen, through that repentance and through water baptism, amen, and to receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. So this, this river of Jordan, to me, had a significance about it that God would choose that place for that message of, of preparing the way of the Lord and repentance for those people to be baptized unto repentance. Now, and I, I, I got to back up because I'm fixing to go into water baptism. We got to do that next Sunday. So let me just, let me go on with my notes. But I just wanted to bring out the significance of Jordan here and, and what God was doing there for those people there in the river. Uh, they were repenting and they were uh, having their sins uh, repented. They, they were forgiven their sins through the obedience to the word of God. Let's go to this fact that uh, the word repentance, as I talked about a while ago, uh, refers to changing one's way of life as the result of a complete change of the thought and attitude with regard to sin and righteousness. In other words, when we truly, truly repent, we're going to be turning around, not 360, All but right. an eight, 180. Yeah. We're going to walk in a different direction. Amen. Where we used to walk one way, our life is going to go in a different direction. That's what true repentance Amen. is. Amen. And so, uh, well, it's, it, I'm, I'm, I'm having thoughts and I'm having, no, don't go there. Um, but but, but we, we have to understand that when we're through with sin, then sin will be through with us. Right. But as long as we're holding on to sin, then we got problems. Sin must be repented of. So uh, Isaiah's prophecy about the ministry of John the Baptist pointed specifically to Jesus. John knew that his ministry uh, was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophesy, prophecy. And when the Jews sent Le Levites and priests to ask John, who are you? In other words, that they, that they were trying to figure John out. Now, a little bit later on in our lesson text, if you'll remember... His attire was quite strange, I thought. Now, you may not think it's strange, but I kind of think it's strange. Because when he came out of the wilderness, his raiment was camel's hair, and he had a leather girdle, girdle about his loins, and look what his diet was. He ate, his meat was locust and wild honey. So he, to me, I kind of look at John as like a, he looked a little different. Maybe for if no other reason, Brother William, he got their attention. You know, sometimes you can't talk to folks as long as you don't have their attention. You got to get their attention. 
I don't know. They didn't say anything about that in the lesson, but that, that just kind of got to my thoughts there, uh, that John got their attention even by his attire. Now, uh, I did read in one commentary, and don't correct me now if I'm wrong, but that even prophets wore uh, an, an attire of that uh, camel's hair. Now, I don't know that. I just read that in a commentary, so that is not scriptural, you understand I'm reluctant to even say some things that are commentary because you know what it is? It's only a man's opinion. Right. So, uh, but anyway, John, John knew that, that he was here for one purpose, and that purpose was to make the way straight for the Lord. John 1, 23, here's, here's his answer to those uh, Levites and priests that ask him, Who are you, John? He said, I am the voice. He didn't say, I am a prophet. He didn't say, I am uh, this great man of God. He just said, I am the voice. That's all he was. Of one crying in the wilderness, make, make straight the way of the Lord, as said the prophet Isaiah. So, so consistently, John is pointing all of those that will listen to him, he's pointing them to Jesus. And, and he only acknowledged himself as the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And, and to me, that, that represents a very humble person. Our pastor has always taught us here that when a man stands in the pulpit and lifts up himself, you can guarantee he's a false prophet. Yep. Amen. Because just like John, we are to lift up Jesus Christ. We're only a voice that God speaks through. We're just an instrument. I read a story um, uh, about uh, these people, and I don't even remember the land, but they uh, it was back during, I think, World War II, and they had an image, a statue of Jesus, and it was damaged during that war, and they said that they tried to repair it as much as possible, but guess what? They could not repair His hands, according to this story, his hands were severed. And so the people decided they didn't want to try to put Jesus' hands back on the, on the statue. But they wanted to put a sign that says, we are his hands. And that's really true, folks. We are his hands. As God's people, we are the hands that are to serve others. We are the hands that are to be our neighbor's helper. And oh my goodness, we could just get on a whole big story about that. Some of us, we, we do that very thing. Some of us are continually helping. But, but my point is, John was, was those helping hands. He was getting the way prepared for the Lord, and he only identified himself as the voice. And, and so the Bible said that, that, uh, that, that John began to tell them and acknowledge the fact that, that I'm not the one. I'm just the voice of one crying in the wilderness. And he knew that Jesus was the promised Messiah that would take away the sin of the world and baptize those who believed on him with the Holy Ghost. John 1, 29 says, The next day John seeth Jesus coming unto him and said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me cometh the man which is preferred before me, for he was before me. And I knew him not, but that he should be made manifest to Israel. Therefore am I come baptizing with water. And John bare record, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and it abode upon him, and I knew him not. But he that sent me to baptize with water, the same said unto me, Upon whom thou shalt see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, the same is he which baptizeth with the Holy Ghost. And I saw and bear record that this is the Son of God. So John is still lifting up the mighty, mighty God of glory. When he saw him coming, he said, Behold the Lamb of God. This is the one that I told you about. This is the one that I came preaching about. This is why I came. So, so the preaching of repentance, it prepares the way of the Lord. For people to be prepared for the coming of the Lord, it's necessary that they first repent. And, you know, it, it concerns me today because, and I, I'm probably going to get a little emotional, but it, it, it concerns me today because I see so many people living an unrepentant life. Their life has gotten so wrapped up in all the things that the world has got to offer. And, and, and God, in many people's life, is the farthest thing from, from him. They don't think about serving the Lord. They think about, what can I do to please my flesh? 
what can I do to make me happy? Instead of, what am I going to do when the Lord does come back one day? You know, just as John was preaching repentance then, I come today to tell you that if you've got sin, you need to repent of it. Because the Lord is coming back. Just like he came after John the Baptist came preaching. He came, and, and he came preaching the same message. And I'm going to say that here in a minute. It's in my notes. But I don't think people realize that if they don't change their ways, there's not but one direction to go. Amen. So, just as John the Baptist came on the scene fulfilling the prophecy of Isaiah, Jesus came on the scene. Matthew 4, 14 says, That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, The land of Zebulun and the land of Nephthalim, by the way of sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. In other words, Jesus came. He came, the Bible said in John 1 and 1, uh, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. He came to His own, and His own received Him not, but to as many as received Him. To them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. Folks, we were considered outcasts and dogs. But I'm going to tell you, Jesus didn't just come for one nation. He came for whosoever will. Thank you, sister, for that amen. He didn't come just for the Jews only. He came for whosoever. He came to his own. He came to the Jews, and they rejected him. And to, today, there are those that have not, not, not believed the Messiah has come. But I thank God that somewhere along the line, somebody told me I had to repent of my sins. Somebody told me that I had to get my heart right with God. Somebody preached to me that I had to get my sins remitted in water in the name of Jesus Christ. And somebody said I could have the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. I'm thankful that God used a voice to speak to my soul. And today I want to be that voice to you and to whoever I can tell them, repent for the Lord is coming back. We don't know when he's coming, but I know he's coming soon. We're living in the end time. We're living in times like we've never lived before. And still, it's just like it was in the days of Noah. They're, they're, mm, amen. Come on. Just as it was in the days of Noah, they're eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage. And they knew not till the flood came and took them all the way. You know, Noah preached righteousness. He was a preacher of righteousness. He preached, it's going to rain. Did they believe him? Did they believe him? How many believed? Eight souls. And that was Noah, his wife, his three sons, and their wives. And all the animals that were saved. An entire world was destroyed because they did not believe the message. And that's why my heart is heavy today, because there's people that still don't believe the message. Oh, they think one day I'm going to get things right with God. When I've done the things I want to do, then I'm going to live for God. When things are just a lot better, I'm going to live for God. But I want you to know that today is the day of salvation. We're, we're not promised a tomorrow. Right here, right now is what we, we have. That's all we have. We don't know what tonight. Some of us come back on Sunday nights. But we don't know if we're going to get to do that or not. I suppose Sister Jessica's grandmother's still in the surgery right now. Okay. I know. Sister Jessica's grandmother and two other ladies were going into Memphis. Is that right? Just, just a few nights ago were rear-ended by a car. And, and you know, they, they weren't going to have a wreck. They were going to have some entertainment, enjoy themselves, have a, I guess, a ladies' night out. I don't know. All I'm saying is we just don't know. We just don't know. But the enemy tells people they've got plenty of time. Or you, you, you've got too much living to do to get any kind of religion. Well, I want to tell you, the best life you could ever live is to get Jesus Christ in your life. Amen. We sing a song that says, can't nobody bless me like Jesus. 
Can't nobody do me like Jesus. I want you to know when you've got Jesus Christ living on the inside, he does marvelous things for you. Amen. When you're down and out, he'll pick you up. Amen. You don't have to have an upper. All you got to call on is Jesus, and his spirit will lift you up. I just wish folks would get addicted to Jesus like they are to things. I'm just being nosy today, aren't I? I'll, I'll do better. I'll get back to my notes. But there's a call going out today, folks, and it's called the call of repentance. And that's exactly what I'm trying to do today is give a call of repentance. Repentance, as I said, is required um, after that we hear and believe the gospel. Matthew 4, 17 says, From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Uh, during during uh, Jesus' ministry on earth, he, he demonstrated his authority to forgive sins. Now, there were religious people of that day. They were called Pharisees and they were called Sadducees. They were religious. They felt like that they were righteous and everybody else was unholy. Okay? They had that, they had that outlook on life. Well, can I just say sometimes as Christians, we get that attitude, and that's all I'm going to say right there. Because there's times I've had to repent because of my attitude toward other people. Okay? You say, well, Sister Creasy, you're the preacher's wife. You're supposed to be perfect. Well, I want to disappoint you today. I'm not perfect. I have to pray a whole lot and repent. Just because you live for God doesn't mean you quit repenting. Probably we do more repenting than a lot of sinners do. I'm just being honest. I'm just being sincere. Because we know that we got to keep things straight between us and God. That's the truth. Hey, when, when, you, when things aren't right between you and God, it's hard to get down and pray because you, you'll do everything but pray. Because you know you need to repent before you get down and ask God for anything. Am, am I being honest? Am I being too plain? Okay. And so uh, the Lord showed that he had the power to forgive sins. Now, the Pharisees and those, those religious people of that day, they didn't like him because they didn't believe he was the Messiah. And, and everything that he did, they tried to find fault with it. And when, they, when the four men brought that man to Jesus that, that could not get himself there, you know the story. When they, when they came to where Jesus was, they wanted, the, they wanted their friend healed. Well, they couldn't get in. So what did they do? They tear the roof off. And all of a sudden, they just lower him down, just kind of like you take a stretcher and put it in front of somebody. That's what they did. They got into Jesus. And the Bible said when he, when Jesus saw their faith, right. whose faith? The faith of those, of the friends, of that guy. Hey, it took some, it took some, it took some effort to get him to Jesus. What, was they, what were they doing? They were exercising faith. Well, why are you calling that faith, Sister Creasy? Because they knew if they got him to Jesus, Jesus would do something for him that they couldn't do. They could bring him to Jesus, but they couldn't heal him. Now, I'm, I'm going to put this on me, okay? Now, you just listen. Here's what I've got to do better at. I've got to do a better job of getting people to Jesus so that Jesus can do something for them. In other words, I need to go out. I don't meet people. I stay at home every day. You folks is about the most people I meet other than po folks at the Walmart or wherever I spend a few dollars at. That's all the folks I see. I don't have a, a, I don't have a connection of friends. Like, y'all go to work, some of y'all. Y'all got a connection. I don't have a connection. But I kind of believe if I pray hard enough, God will give me a connection. So what I'm saying to me is I've got to do a better job of getting somebody to Jesus because if I can get them to Jesus, then Jesus can do the rest of it. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, we need to fill up these pews getting people to Jesus up here. Get them up in the house. You didn't have any trouble getting in here today because it wasn't that crowded. But I'm telling you, if, we, if, if I do a better job, see, I'm not talking to y'all, I'm talking to me. If I do a better job of getting my, my acquaintances in here, I believe Jesus can do something for them that I can't do for them. Okay, now I got off that story, but, but I'm getting back there. So the Bible said in, in Matthew 9 and 2, And behold, they brought him to him a man sick of the palsy. He not only was sick 
because he had the palsy, he was probably sick of it. I mean, just think about it. When you can't get up and move around anymore. That's sad. That's sad. Uh, lying on the bed, and Jesus, seeing their faith, there it is, said unto the sick of, of the palsy, Son, be of good cheer. Thy sins be forgiven thee. The Lord spoke these words when he saw the faith of those, of those men. And, 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 and so the text doesn't definitely mention repentance here, but I got a feeling that man on that stretcher had already prepared his heart for what God was fixing to do for him. Right. I, I do believe that. Because he had heard about Jesus somehow or another, and no doubt he couldn't get himself to Jesus to be healed, but he had some friends that could get him there. So some, somewhere along the line, there was some faith in his heart because he got, he got what he needed. And, and so, so, so the, we, we see here that, that there was some faith working here. And, and so this all indicates that that there had to be a transformation uh, taking place in this man's heart, and, and, and he responded and got where Jesus was. He had, he had heard about the Lord, and now he's in his presence. And so the Lord is telling him, be of good cheer, thy sins be forgiven thee. Well, when he said those words, those yeah. religious people, those oh, Pharisees, yeah, those scribes yeah. who didn't believe in, the, in Jesus, they started complaining. <laughs> In Luke 15 and 2, it says, And the Pharisees and scribes murmured. I mean, boy, they just talking in each other's ears. I can just imagine it going on right then and there. And, and they're saying, This man receiveth sinners. Uh, oh, 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 I jumped down to the wrong scripture. Can I, can I back out of that a minute? Let me back out of that. I, I, I jumped too far there. I'm, I'm going there. I, I, I jumped on the wrong scripture there. But anyway... The Lord just went on to tell them whether it's easier to say thy sins be forgiven thee or take up thy bed and walk. So that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sin, he said to the, to the sick of the palsy, arise, take up your bed and walk. So when we repent, he's got the power to forgive us of our sins. Don't you ever let any devil burp out of hell tell you that you can have your sins forgiven. Right. All you've got to do is repent, confess, and forsake. Amen. Now, let me get to Luke 15 and 2. These religious leaders, they didn't, they didn't believe the law on the Lord, and so they're, they're complaining. And they're complaining woo, over this. Jesus had called a tax collector to follow him. Well, nobody liked those tax collectors because they took their money. And some took it uh, over an abundance. In other words, they actually stole, some stole from the people. So they didn't like these tax collectors. And the Lord passed by a man by the name of Levi, which is known as Matthew, and he told him to follow him. Well, he followed the Lord. And it come time to eat, and Levi, he tells the Lord, I want you to come and eat at my house. Well, guess who his friends are? Nothing but sinners. So Jesus and his disciples go and eat with sinners. <gasps> How horrible the Pharisees thought that was, that he would go have a meal with sinners. And they said, they murmured, saying, this man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. Now, this is what I was talking about a while ago. Sometimes we have a Pharisee, Pharisee attitude ourselves yeah. about who we want to be around. Right. And as Christians, we have to repent. Right. Because if we don't let our light shine, where are people that are lost going to see a light? Right. Right. It, does that make any sense at all to you guys? Here was the Lord's response in verse 4. He began to tell them a parable about the lost sheep. And he, he began to ask them this question. If you had a hundred sheep and you lost, one of those sheep got lost, they strayed away. Would you not leave those 99 that are safe, that are safe, they're, they're, they're protected, they're in the sheepfold. There's no way that anything's going to bother them. Wouldn't you go looking for that one sheep that was lost? 
So he's, he's putting this a, a, as a question to them. And, and wouldn't, you, wouldn't you go out and search until you found it? And, and then he said in verse 5, and when he had found it, he laid it on his shoulder and rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise... Joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. Wow. So Jesus' behavior uh, that offended those Pharisees and scribes was the, the real reason why he came. He didn't come. I remember our focus verse was they that are whole have no need of a physician, but they that are sick. You know, if you're well, you don't run down to the emergency room, do you? No. If you're well, you don't call up trying to get an appointment at the doctor's office. No. When you're sick, sometimes you get blessed if you get an appointment. I don't need to go there. But they that are whole, they don't need a physician. But they that are sick need a physician. And that's what the Lord is telling them. You don't like it because I'm eating with sinners, but how else are we going to reach souls? How else are we going to reach the lost if they don't know? You know, if, if you don't know something's wrong, how are you going to live what's right? That's right. Amen. Somebody's got to tell you. Amen. If you don't know that your sins are going to take you to hell, you got to have somebody to tell you to repent of them. Amen. That's right. Amen. So, the lesson said this. And I'm going to say it because the lesson said it. But I have mixed thoughts about this. The, our lesson, the, my teacher's manual said, and I, I don't, I've lost my student book, so I don't know what your student book said. But um, it said these, these represented the Pharisees and scribes. Um, that, that the 99 just persons were those who thought themselves to have no need of repentance need for repentance. These were represented in the Pharisees and scribes. They thought they were okay. You know. Right. Uh, right. But but the one lost sheep was that repentant sinner. And, and so the fact is, and, and, I, and I understand um, but I also understand that the Pharisees and scribes, they had to repent too just like the, the lost sheep that was lost. But anyway, we we've got to We've got to reach out. Let, let me just preach to me, okay? I've got to reach out, not we. I've got to reach out to lost souls like I've never reached out before. And can I just say I'm doing a poor job? Will you forgive me? I've already asked the Lord, so please forgive me. There's folks. I think I know why it's hard to get them to church. I think sometimes people feel like they don't fit in when they come to church because, you know, there's churchy people around. You know, maybe. I don't know. But the thing of it is, before people can come in, they've got to have somebody that cares about them to invite them in. That's true. That's right. And the only way they're going to hear the gospel is if we, if we either they hear it here or we give it to them on a one-on-one. Our pastor was at work. Of course, he knew he knew what he knew he was wrong, but it was his friend at work that God used to help him to come to the house of God. So what I'm saying is, I've got to be more sensitive because somebody needs to hear the fact that God loves them. John three sixteen tells us that for God so loved the world, not just Christian people, the whole world. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, and that means everybody, everybody. that excludes no one and it includes everybody. It doesn't matter how far people go in sin, God loves them. And I think that's why people feel like that they, have you heard people say, well, if I come to church, the ceiling might fall in. Yeah. I'm not sure why they say that. When you, of course, I grew up on the church pew, so I never had a problem with coming to church unless I wasn't living right, and then I didn't want to go to church because I, I, I didn't want to get convicted of my wrongdoing. Right, right, right. See, I knew better. Yeah. Hey, Sister Crazy, you a sinner? I, you guarantee you. Not a, I wasn't a good one because all the time I was sinning, I knew God was on my trail, and I need to get back in the house of God because <laughs> I knew if I died, I was going to hell. 
You say, Sister Chrissy, you're talking plain. You're using that word a whole lot. I'm just going to tell you. I heard a song this morning on the way to church. Now, you don't hear this song on any of the stations around here. But it was talking about September the 11th, 911. And the, the little chorus had something that's, that said, talking about the towers that came down. Some few were saved, most were lost, some were never found. And said, if hell is that hot, I don't want to go there. And I thought, ma'am, whoever's singing this song, hell's going to be hotter than that. And I, I just don't think people realize the severity of what is out ahead of them if they don't repent. You know, in Luke 5, the Bible tells us, and I've, I've lost, I've lost, have I read Luke 5? Have I read Luke 5? Okay. See what I do when I leave my notes, I just forget where I'm at. Um, but I already talked about Levi, didn't I? Um, and, and here again is our is our focus verse. Uh, the scribes and Pharisees that they murmured against against the Lord's disciples, saying and asked them, Why do you eat and drink with publicans and, and sinners? And Jesus answering said unto them, They that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. So so the Lord is is declaring that his mission was to call the sinners to repent. And really, folks, there is a doctor in the house today, and his name is Dr. Jesus. And he came to make everybody whole, saint, sinner alike. You know, I think sometimes we as God's people, sometimes we don't take things to the Lord like we should. We deal with things that we shouldn't have to deal with. We carry around burdens that we shouldn't carry around. And I think it's time that we understand that we can cast all of our cares on Jesus because he cares for us. We shouldn't let the enemy beat us down and browbeat us like we do, folks. As God's people, we've got a great physician. He'll heal us no matter what's going on in our life. But the main mission he came for was for sinners. And, and so the Lord declared, declared that. And, and just like the parable of the lost sheep, the righteous are those who... Uh, you know, if, 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 if you've got the Lord in your life, you, then, then thank God you've got him. But it's sinners that need to acknowledge their need for spiritual recovery. So, so God commanded, commands everyone everywhere to repent. You see, here's the thing. Repentance isn't just a suggestion, folks. It's God's universal command. Acts 17 and 30 declares this. When Paul was visiting there at Athens, he, he's up there at Mars Hill, and he's looking around, and he's... He's seeing all these kinds of statues and all these kinds of gods. And even there was uh, something there that said, to the unknown God. And, and so, um, so Paul is, is recognizing these people. They, they, they've, got, they've got some kind of religious about them, but they don't know who, who Jesus is. They don't know who the true God is. And, and so in Acts 17 and 30, uh, we read the Bible says, And the times of this ignorance God winked at. There was a time when, 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 you know, people could, you could overlook that fact. But the word says, but now commanded. And there's the word that I was looking for, commanded. God has a universal command, and it is that all men everywhere to repent. And, and so uh, we we got to understand that there's no excuse. There is no excuse if we don't know the Savior. There's no excuse if we don't live for him. Because we've heard it. Most of us have heard it all of our lives. Most of us have heard uh, the message of salvation. Th there's no excuse. So uh, God commands everyone everywhere to repent. And Paul wanted them to understand the scope of this command. And he spoke these words in Acts 17, 26 and 27. I'm kind of backtracking here a little bit. And said, and have made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. And have determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation that they should seek the Lord if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. And, and that's the truth, folks. You know, God's not way off out yonder somewhere, but when you speak the name of Jesus, he listens. 
For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. When you speak the name of Jesus in a repentant heart for calling on that name, he's going to come to you, and you're going to find him to be right there. Verse 31 says, because he hath appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, in that he hath raised him from the dead. All, all Paul is saying there's coming a judgment day. There's coming a reckoning day. Uh, people live today as if, you know, they're never going to give an account for their life, that they can do anything they want to, and nobody, you know, nobody's going to do anything about it. That's the world we're living in. Uh, people will blatantly curse you to your face. And does, they don't care that they do that. People will uh, carjack you, so to speak. <laughs> you know, you're just trying to get some gas. That's where I, I see and hear, uh, hear of it at people at gas stations get carjacked. They don't, they don't care that they're doing wrong. They don't mind pulling a gun and taking people's life, even if they don't even know who they're shooting at, right. because they're just doing what they want to do. They're living what they want to live, not re realizing there's a lot of things that people think they don't, ha they don't have to give an account for. But one day there's coming a reckoning day unless it's been put under the blood, unless it's been repented of and covered with the blood. But when it's under the blood, it's gone. What sins are you talking about? Jesus says, I don't remember them anymore. When, it, when he's covered it with the blood, it's gone. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Paul was telling the people that day there's going to be a judgment, and the only way to prepare for that day is to have our hearts changed through the preaching of God's word and obeying it. I'm just thankful that God sent a voice into my life one day, Brother Joey, and told me that I had to repent of my sins. I'm so thankful that they, they told me what I needed to do to, to be saved. And so the ability, folks, to repent is definitely a gift from God. Yes. You know, I think sometimes we take this gift for granted. I think sometimes we abuse what God has given us. Um, sometimes we live too much in the flesh with an attitude, with a fleshly attitude um, of let, let me say it like this. Sometimes we forget where we came from. And we forget what God forgave us of. We can look at others and see all the things they're doing wrong. And I hate to use this word, but here it is, and judge them. It's easy, easy to point our finger at others and see, say all the things they're doing wrong. But sometimes we forget where God brought us from and what God delivered us from. And, and, and here's the thing. God is standing, waiting, ready to forgive anyone that will repent. That's the beautiful part of, of our lesson today. Um, when the Apostle Peter explained why he had gone to the house of Cornelius that day, uh, remember, he really, if you'll remember the story, those of you that know the story, uh, he was praying. And, of course, the Apostle Peter had the keys to the kingdom because Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Against right. it. And thou art Peter. And I give unto thee the keys to the kingdom. So on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, Peter opened that door to, to whosoever will that day when he began to preach. Right. And there was 120 that was gathered there in the upper room that received the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then when it got noised abroad, the multitude came came and Peter began to preach to them and I read just a little excerpt from it over there in Acts 2 uh, 36 and 37 when he began to tell them that, that they, they began to wonder what was going on, what was happening and of course Peter began to tell them this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel that in the last days said God I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. He began to tell them about that and then he went on and began to preach to them about Jesus and began to tell them that they had crucified him and of course they said uh, prick, they were pricked in their heart what must we do and he said repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost so there was added to the church that day about 3,000 souls well, days later, I don't know how long, the Bible really doesn't tell us, but Peter's praying, and he's waiting for food to be prepared, and while he's praying, uh, God begins to let him go into this vision, and he begins to see a sheet coming down, 
And, and in that vision, the Lord tells him uh, to kill and eat. And, and, and it happens three times. And, and each time, Peter's saying, Lord, nothing unclean or common has ever come into my mouth. And God said, whatever I clean, co cleanse, call not thou common or unclean. And so God begins, the Lord begins to tell Peter, go, you go down, there's men waiting to take you to a certain place. And, and he goes, and he goes to the Cornelius' house. And Cornelius had been fasting and praying, and God began to... Uh, tell him to send for Peter, and he would tell him words whereby he could be saved. And of course, while uh, while he's waiting on Peter to get down there, he gathers all of his family together, and they're there waiting to hear what Peter says. And as Peter begins to preach the word, guess what happens? Faith comes alive, and, and, and they begin to believe the word, and the Holy Ghost comes down, and they, they're filled with the Holy Ghost. And these are Gentiles. These are what we consider dogs. And, and so, or what, what were considered dogs in those days. And so when Peter begins to explain to uh, why he went to the house of Cornelius to his Jewish brethren, they got excited about it. Acts 11 and 8 said, Then have God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Uh, those who refuse to repent will perish, Luke 13 and 3 tells us. Uh, Except you repent, ye shall all likewise perish. So when we obey this universal command to repent and experience baptism in the name of Jesus Christ, Guess what? We've got a promise. And that promise is we can be forgiven. We can be forgiven. And then not only forgiven, but we can receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Because Acts 2.38 tells us these words. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So here's the thing, folks, in, in, in closing today. God calls everyone everywhere to repent. And I know I said that a while ago, but I feel like I need to say it again. And when we repent from, from a, a, a sincere and an humble heart, then the Lord has promised he's going to forgive us and he will fill us with his spirit. Um, you know, there's things that we've got to do. If we could repent for folks, we'd probably repent for some of our family, wouldn't we? But we can't repent for them. They've got to do that for themselves. And, and, and uh, all around the world, uh, the power of repentance is being experienced and the Holy Ghost is being poured out upon all those who will call on the name of the Lord. And, you know, most of the time, one of the hardest things for people to say is, I'm sorry. Have you ever noticed that even yourself sometimes? When things aren't going right and, and you want to be right and the other person thinks they're right, and then just to, to get things back on the level... What's wrong with just saying I'm sorry? Right. Nothing. Even if you feel like you were right, you're better off saying I'm sorry, even if you know you're not wrong. Right. Because there's something about a soft answer turns away wrath. Right. Uh, but, but, but we are wrong when we sin, okay? I, I don't want to confuse you there. But, and we are to say I'm sorry, God. Right. But our repentance has got to come from a heart that is truly sorry right. and truly wanting to be right with God. Right. Right. Being right means that we're through with what we were doing wrong. Amen. Amen. Being right means we're through with what we were doing wrong and we're walking a different path. We're on the, we're on the right road and we're not going to let anything pull us away from what's right. It doesn't matter how inviting it is. It doesn't matter how enticing it is. Amen. You see, if we love God, I said, if we love God, like we profess we love God, the things of this world have no attraction for a child of God. And if we just simply fall in love with Jesus and love him with all of our heart, we're not going to have any problem with sinning anymore. We just got to truly repent, truly be sorry, and then forsake those things and truly serve God with all of our heart, soul, and mind. I think what's happened to a lot of folks, they forget they got to give God their all. They can give God part of their heart, but they're not ready to give it all to God. Right. And the reason why is they enjoy what they're doing. But you got to be sick and tired of being sick and tired of the life you're living. And when you get sick and tired of it, then you're ready to repent and get rid of those things. And then Jesus Christ will come into your heart and life. 
when we truly, truly make that transition into, into li living for the Lord. I thank God today, Romans 2 and 4. I didn't give, I'm sorry, Romans 4 and 2, Brother Mark. Can you put that up there? Okay, try 2 and 4 then. I don't have it written down. Try 2 and 4. Okay, that's what I wanted. It says, Or despisest thou the riches of his goodness and forbearance and long suffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leadeth thee to repentance. Amen. Folks, it's God's goodness, it's God's mercy that has brought us to where we are today. Amen. And it's God's goodness and mercy that is leading people to repent today. Yes. God didn't come to beat you over the head with the, with the Ten Commandments. He came to love you right. and, and for you to love him right. and to have that relationship with him that you could serve him out of, out of a heart of love. And it's his goodness that, that does this for us. Don't ever think that because you, you've done wrong, you could never get your heart right with God. That's why Jesus came. Right. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for Amen. us. And it's his goodness today. How much he loves you, this is how much. He spread out his hands, and he, he, they, they nailed him to an old rugged cross. They nailed his feet in his hands, and they put a crown of thorns upon his head, and he did it because he wanted you to be able to repent of your sins and be born again of the water and of the Spirit. God bless you today. Jesus loves you, and I love you.